Small Caps is partnered with the Australian Stock Report. Looking to make better investment decisions? Visit australianstockreport.com.au. The Call is brought to you by CMC Markets, a world-leading online trading platform for CFDs and shares around the globe. Well, good afternoon to you. We've made it to Friday. This is The Call, 10 companies picked by you, two great expert guests all in an hour. And it is the 15th of July. I'm Nadine Blaney. Guess who's back next week? David Kosh. So looking forward to that. Uh, here with me today, Adam Dawes from Sean Partners and Nathan Samasundaram from Deep Data Analytics. Guys, welcome to the program. Adam, yes. good afternoon to you. You love a Friday I as much as I do. I do love a Friday. I should be at lunch, but I'm here. Oh, thank you anyway. so much. Uh, this week, it looks as if we're going to be down by, yeah, close to 2%. Today's yeah. not looking so good. Why? Well, well, no, just tell me what you think about overall market performance right now. I think it's actually okay. Yeah. Um, obviously, we've seen a forward now starting to sort of move sideways, which is sort of building a bit of a base. But still, investors are nervous. Everybody's nervous and volatility is quite high. You know, years and years ago, we used to do sort of four, maybe five points, maybe 10 points. Now we're doing 100 points in a day. So the volatility is definitely there. And I think that really does reflect on the way people are thinking and potentially positioning portfolios. We're certainly seeing a sell-off in the resource sector yeah. in the next last coming couple of days, if not week. The coal sector is looking a little bit better with China's announcement yesterday. So look, it's all sort of moving around. I think overall, but sentiment is still okay. Um, I, I, you know, we've seen a couple of these cycles already, so I'm, I'm a little bit more comfortable with that cycle and what's happening because obviously you can look through that until next year potentially, and then interest rates start falling again, and then here we go. You know, so I'm okay, I'm okay with where the market is at the moment. Nathan, how about you? Adam just made it sound really sort of easy there, didn't he? You know, next year <laughs> we'll we'll get recession and then we'll get interest rates Let's falling. Get what's to worry about? Let's go. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's like it's like getting a haircut. Just <laughs> chop it off, and then it'll grow back up. Oh, you look uh, good, by the way. <laughs> thanks. It's it's a DIY. Um, <laughs> look, at the end of the day, I think uh, where the markets are is dealing with the central bank manipulated cycles, where, as Adam uh, explained, you have these clean cycles where things just fall, recover, everything's fine, and nothing gets affected. But we've done that for more than a decade, and I think there's some structural problems that's going to play out. This is going to be interesting uh, because we've been out of all the uh, growth commodities for a while, and it was almost inevitable on the data side that when you have the slowdown and the recession fears come through, commodities will fall. Um, and the cycle is playing out. The trick is going to be, this is the first time in more than a decade, where we're not going to really get a massive stimulus pump on the other side of the cycle, because you just can't when you've got inflation at 40 year high. They're trying to get inflation down. So it's one of those traps that we're going into. Again, it's easy to say yeah, this time it's different, but it probably is. And that's what I think spooking the market at the moment. So everyone's trying to work things out. But the reality is we haven't had a panic stage. Nobody's panicking yet. Yes, the market's down 10 to 20 percent, but we have not seen the panic yet. And you don't get to the bottom of the uh, bear market without having a good panic session. So I'm still waiting. Got it. Thank you. I wonder if that's a recessionary indicator when haircuts go DIY again. We'll see. <laughs> I should, uh, should probably do one myself. Yeah. Anyhow, let's get to some of these companies that we'll be talking about today. Paradigm Biopharmaceuticals had a bit of news out this week. Neo Metals for Lexi. Hope you're watching Lexi. Best and Lest in the smaller end of the market, Austell and Woolworths. But as per usual, let's start with the stock of the day. In the big end of town, you could say Rio Tinto. It's set with its second quarter production results. Commodity price decreasing in the quarter as, to Nathan's point, those recessionary fears grow. 
Getting into the specifics, first half charges increased by approximately $400 million in pre-tax underlying earnings. Aluminium production was 10% lower than the second quarter. Looking ahead, it's flagging that Russia-Ukraine conflict is a possibility for a further weakness coming through. What do our guests think? Let's find out about the stock of the day. Nathan, we'll start with you on Rio. You just expressed your pessimistic view of where we go from here, but uh, is there value already in some of these mining names or do you need to wait? I think there is, but uh, you'll get it cheaper. Um, I think the cycle is starting. Um, we've had the iron ore now come back below 100. Um, I suspect there's more downside risk. It needs to get to an equilibrium. China is still um, ramping up stimulus, but it's actually not flowing through like previous cycles. So they are still using stimulus to stabilize their, I suppose, stabilize their market uh, economy rather than get it growing again. Uh, we're still seeing a fair amount of risk in the Chinese property market, especially in the property developers. Um, so we're not getting the ramp. But the positive news is China is talking about a fair amount of money being put into an infrastructure type fund and they will drive infrastructure rather than property in the next cycle. Is that going to happen tomorrow? Probably not. It's going to take a bit of time. A lot of the uh, you know, belt and road uh, projects outside China are probably going to be slowed down because most of the economies that they build into are having a really tough time uh, at this point in the cycle. So the whole global growth play is going to be tough. And I found it interesting that people are worried, suddenly shocked by weaker commodity prices. Guess what? They've been falling for a, a few weeks now. And then you've got the other side of higher cost. Well, um, you look at some of the miners, especially in the gold sector, they've been smashed on the back of higher cost. But the rest of the miners actually didn't get pulled back. So the updates are going to be about weaker commodity prices and higher costs. And so that's part of the reason why we stayed out and that's playing out. And And I think that's going to play out for a bit more. Um, I don't see a big upside coming out to BHP, Rio and FMG in the short term when iron ore is falling with weak steel outlook. So I think it's going to be tough. I don't think you need to jump in right now. But of course, these are cyclicals. So they go up, they come down uh, and people get excited. These are a long term dividend yield stocks. They're not. Uh, and so when this cycle plays out, be patient, mm -hmm. wait for it to bottom. And when commodity prices start to recover after a pullback cycle, that's you. That's when you get back in. Uh, Adam, are your clients out of the big miners right now? Mm -hmm. Would you be looking to get them in at any point when? Yeah, well, looking at that chart, it definitely looks like uh, there's some value starting to come into that. But I echo exactly what Nathan's saying, that this is uh, got a little long, a longer way to go. One of the data points that we've got is China's GDP. I think it's coming out today sometime. That will be interesting to see. Obviously, the GDP number is going to be lower. So global or GDP growth for China was expected to be around 5.5. If that's going to come in a little bit lower, then we're going to see the iron ore stocks continue to fall. Um, I've been looking at Fortescue, and I think around that sort of uh, $14 level would be a good place to, to, to look at that. BHP at 37, I think you could definitely look closer to $30 on that. And around for Rio, a, a buy entry level would be about $87 for me on those three stocks. But remember also, they do produce a ton, a lot of iron ore, and they can basically produce that at around $20 a ton. And currently it's sitting around $100 a ton, dip below 100 today and uh, last night, and then sort of come back a little bit. So potentially there's still a lot of profitability to be made in these iron ore uh, stocks. But I just think that entry price has probably got to be finessed. Yes, my clients hold BHP, Rio and Fortescue. We, we buy them not just for the dividend, but for that longer term outlook. Iron ore certainly been very, very good over the last coming couple of years. So it's been very, very good to us. One on the dividends, but then also uh, on the price. So look, I'm comfortable. I've, our Rocky, our, our resource analyst has got a hold on Rio and a buy on uh, BHP and Fortescue. So that's sort of where he sits uh, with that. So I'd be holding off $87 is where I'd look to pick up some Rio. Thank you. Okay, so that is the stock of the day, Rio Tinto, an expression of the period of the cycle that we're in, no doubt. Let's get to these companies that have been nominated by you. Uh, one of them is Paradigm Pharmaceuticals. That's where we'll start. P-A-R, this is for Courtney. She's saying, what's the go? Shares popped after its latest deal. So is this a good signal to jump in? Is it material enough? Um, I did note that uh, there was some news announced this week to do with Paradigm. 
Um, there was a research partnership deal done this week. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with the company, mm. um, Adam, but when you look at it, you know, and the research around it, what do you think? Yeah, so um, Paradigm, obviously a biotech stock, um, and basically they have to meet an endpoint for their drugs, but basically their drug is an osteoarthritis drug for knees, and that's obviously as we're all getting older and uh, moving forward, that is certainly something that would be very beneficial for a lot of people. So that uh, osteoarthritis, uh, they're saying that in the US is estimated to be around about 30 million people suffer from osteoarthritis in the knee, which basically means that they'll benefit from that. And if they price their drug at around sort of two and a half thousand euro in, in the US, drugs are a little bit more expensive than here in Australia. But if they price their drug at around about two and a half thousand dollars per year per person for that for that total accessible market that moves in into the billions now total accessible market is always something that the companies will always put out and say mm -hmm. it's, it looks fantastic but really at the end of the day you've got to be a little bit careful uh, with that one as well so they have started to see some progress in their clinic side of things uh, it is working they still need to go through phase three study which they've got i think they had 60 patients in the phase two but they've got to then widen that out to 700 people so that obviously uh, allows that to uh, potentially uh, be um, not meet the endpoint. So roundabout way of saying uh, I'm not a fan of most biotechs. I stay in the healthcare space, but in the CSL and ResMeds of the world, I think it's too risky for my clients. Obviously for other people, but I've been burnt so many times where the where the, the business just doesn't meet the endpoint, and it's a binary outcome, yes or no. And if it's a no, the stock will fall and has will continue to fall. We can see on the chart that that one has fallen a fair way but I just think it's way too risky for clients at the moment. So I would say it's a sell and uh, no. Got it, thank you. Uh, do you see it different, Nathan? From what I understand, Paradigm is one of those biotechs that is repurposing existing pharmaceuticals for other applications. Is this a biotech that would be worth taking a little bit of a, a risk on? Yeah, you know me, I get sucked into biotechs uh, like everyone else. Um, it's a high risk, high return. Um, so it's it does well uh, when mining stocks don't do well because punters who are taking that kind of risk return profile, they tend to gravitate from miners to uh, biotechs. Um, interestingly, everyone is in love with mining at the moment and that's still not going away despite the fall in commodity prices. So do I think a lot of money is going to come into biotechs? Probably not in the short term. But again, that's the time to look at it. Uh, I, I would be looking at, you know, when you're looking at biotech investing, you, you can never pick one or two because the risk is pretty high, as Adam said. Um, you know, they're either going to make it or they go broke. Um, and they take a long time. You know, we're talking decades to become an overnight success. And, uh, you know, most of us who invest in that sector know that we fund a lot of them to uh, not much. So you've got to be careful. You've got to be looking at high risk uh, investment. This is probably, you know, it's always worries me when it gets repositioned. Um, you, you know, you've got to trust management to go through the process to deliver. When they're repositioning, there's always risk. There's always cap raising is going to come through. Uh, look, I don't know management that well. Uh, the product, I think the deal with NFL, it's positive, but I don't think it's going to, you know, bring in the numbers yet. Um, and then you look at, there's two main brokers covering it. One has not published for a while. And both of them are downgraded. Um, they've been cutting target prices lower and lower. You're buying the blue sky, and they're cutting the blue sky. So the brokers are not, who are potentially are the guys who raise money for them, are not positive on the story at the moment. They're still downgraded. So it tells me that they're not certain about what's playing out. This is high risk at the best of times. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be jumping into a stock when the brokers in play are downgrading. So. I'd say, look, I love the sector. It's a high risk return, but this is probably not one to look at at this point. Too risky. Got it. Thanks, Nathan. All right. The next on the list is Neo Metals, and this one is for Lexi. She's uh, wondering uh, what you guys think of it after its most recent update. So Neo Metals, um, you know, lithium battery recycling. It did have an update coming through about a deal that it had done with Mercedes Benz in a partnership about a recycling plant there. It's always Nathan helpful when you drop a Merck or a Tesla or something like that into your into your release, isn't it? Yeah, look, you got to love the car industry at the moment with EV and everything playing out. I, I think uh, recently uh, BMW has become a SaaS model. Go yeah. figure. Um, we're, we're in a changing world, so you can never account for anything to be stable. Um, look, the main thematic at the moment is 
he, all the commodities had a huge run. And then someone out there started to use the term, term super cycle, and that was the end of it. And everything has come off. Now, EV uh, commodities have come off the boil. And it's interesting because you know what's going to happen. It's a most obvious trend. But at the same time, you know things always take longer than what you think. So there's, there's this cycle that's being delayed and people are playing out. Is lithium the only solution? No. But is that going to be one of the solutions? Yes. Is there enough of it? Uh, that's debatable depending on the timing. I think there's a lot of people now finding it. Now, Neo Metals is a pretty good uh, play. I think a lot of people like management. They've gone about it the right way. I think it plays well. But overall, the sector is in a bit of a profit-taking cycle at the moment. Everyone's trying to work out what's the next step. So I think in the short term, um, I think commodities, as with anything in a recessionary worry, uh, are going to struggle. Um, especially the ones that are not producing yet will, you know, they're not benefiting from the high commodity prices as it is. So in the short term, I'm not jumping in. Um, now, EV commodities are of interest. Um, you look at the big guys, you know, the MinRes, the IGOs who are playing the lithium cycle, they're coming back as well. So look at the big guys, the big guys turn first, that'll tell you when the cycle is starting to get positive again. Um, at this point, I'm looking at all the mining mm -hmm. stocks, especially the EV commodities. But look, copper is underperforming. You need copper for everything, even EV. So if the copper is underperforming, lithium's not going to do that great. So at this point, I think you watch and wait. Don't jump in yet. Yeah, well, Neo Metals, though, in it's just to add some color, is moving away from the you know mineral extraction, mineral production, and into that yeah. more higher end recycling Correct. and manufacturing, and yeah. really right around the world. Is that more attractive to you than just somebody digging something out of the ground? I think so, because what it, what it does is, you're right, they've got that WA plant or the, the project in WA, and they do evaluate and explore uh, lithium projects. But yes, they're, they're operating three, <clears throat> three sort of segments where they include that recycling side mm -hmm. of things and looking for, obviously, uh, that deal with Mercedes, you know, does help the, the project a little bit. And anything with an ESG tailwind is mm -hmm. going to look okay or going to look a little bit better going forward. So, uh, yeah, I do think that that is a positive because they're not just taking stuff out of the yeah. ground. They're actually doing something with that and recycling. Now, um, lithium batteries, yes, there's a, there's a lot of them out there, but there's going to be more over the next 10 years. We know that's mm -hmm. been projected. So, um, and the share price, I think, is is down about 50%. It was a hard dollar. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, dollar sixty now, sort of. Uh, um, not dollar eighty, ninety cents. Need to put my glasses on. Um, but yeah, so I think that there's that 50% fall um, certainly looks looks better, uh, and there's potential of some value there. But I agree with Nathan that the the lithium market is taking some time to recover, and it will go through this consolidation period. So it would, IGO is definitely my pick in the space, but I think with the ESG tailwinds that these guys have got, I think it does provide a better or more comfort to investors. And so this would be a hold from me yeah, at these levels. Yeah, trading at 94 cents today. Okay, I just thought that I would take the time because this might you know, help inform your views. Um, uh, that that uh, GDP read out of China has come oh, in yeah? and it was extraordinarily weak, actually. We saw... Um, GDP coming in in the second quarter uh, to just 0.4% year on year in the quarter. So it really did miss forecasts wow. there. So that so is that confirmation is slowing. An annualized number there? Uh, let me just see. 5.5 um, is expected. Let me see. Nope. No. Okay. Well, that's definitely low. So that will put yeah. a lot of pressure on our commodities today continued pressure on our commodities market as well as then it won't give us a great uh, lead in for next week as well. Sorry, that's second quarter GDP at 0.4% year on year. Yeah. Missing expectations, um, forecast to expand 1% in that quarter from a year earlier. Wow. So that's pretty negative. Yeah. Okay, we'll get some analysis on that a little bit later in the live stream. <laughs> but let's get back to what we're doing here because with that as the backdrop, best and less, this mm -hmm. is coming from David. David provides sort of his assessment of the company and, you know, First full year since listing, yes, he recognizes the retail discretionary space likely to come under pressure. It also had COVID reduced store closures, but he's wondering because it's a little less discretionary because it's children's clothing essentially, and they've got a loyalty program for moms, et cetera, et cetera. Also talking about the dividend yield 
Um, how do you rate the outlook prospects for best and last? Adam, just going by memory, I think you liked this one, didn't you? Uh, no. no? I, well, no. Okay. I mean, I, I, if, if you're going to go into anything that's in this category, for me, it would be like a Wes Farmers because then you've got Kmart, Target, Officeworks, and you've got some more diversification. Bunnings. Bunnings, which, yeah. So, and that, absolutely right, that discretionary spend is coming back down. With interest rates going up 50 basis points, there's talk of 75 basis points in Australia next month, which is, you know, it's going to be 50 no matter what, but they're looking potentially looking at 75. So that means, you know, another 400, 500, 600 dollars coming out of people's back pocket that they have to pay on their mortgage. It does really slow down on discretionary spend. Now, the problem is with best and less Kmart, Target, these kinds of things, it's the race to the bottom. How cheap can you get a kid's pair of pajamas or, or a pair mm -hmm. of jeans? Like they're four bucks anyway, or something like that. So, um, best and less have come out with a lot of you know child uh, uh, China slavery issues, and they've done a lot of work to sort of make sure that they you know people are informed about what the sweatshops are happening and what they're doing with their products. But for me, I prefer to be if you're going to do that would be something like a Wes Farmers. Um, it's more of a conglomerate, bigger, badder, those kinds of things. So for me, this is a no. I mean, discretionary spend, as we know, um, is, is going to come off. Maybe uh, if you wanted to get into the apparel side of things, um, uh, Uni or La Visa yep. are two sort of ones, but they have, they're very discretionary. Um, but yeah, I, I think for this one, it would be a no for me, best and less, not really that keen on it. Nathan, what do you think about BST, best and less? Yeah, look, I, I shopped there. So. I think <laughs> yeah. maybe it was you that like best and less. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like it. I like it. It's just that as an investment case, it doesn't work for me, um, you know, just the whole retail sector. Now, the interesting part about it is the retail sector is bad and everyone knows it. So that's pretty much priced in. And the question is going to be is where's the recovery cycle coming from? Um, I think Best and Less has the offering to get in a tough market. Um, you're looking for stocks that are going to do well in the tough market. I think Best and Less will do well through a, a slowdown. But the question is going to be, is that going to you know, recover in the short term? Probably not. Uh, I mean, Adam's right. We're talking about uh, Fed looking at 100 basis point hike. Canada just raised by 100 basis point. RB, RBNZ went faster. Mm. So there's real pressure on RBA to put up rates. Um, and you've got property prices rolling over. So there's, you know, petrol prices are still high. We've got this tax holiday on petrol prices. When that comes off, you know, petrol prices are going to go even higher. So in that context, it's going to be tough, and everyone knows that, and retail sector has underperformed. Um, so I'm not trying to pick a winner in retail yet, but it is one I'm looking at. So just to give you a context, um, earnings always get chopped up, and so the PE looks good, and then it doesn't look good because earnings comes off and multiple goes up again. So to discount for that, you want to look at retail sectors, and these are retail sectors are classic uh, cyclical, you want to look at them when they get to single digits. So if you're thinking recession, you're thinking real downswing, you want to pick it up in a single digit PE. And it's not single digit yet. So I'm staying out of all of them. But best and less, super retail, shaver shop, these kind of you know the basic shopping um, places I am looking at and I'm keeping an eye on them. But they're not cheap enough yet. The panic hasn't come in. The real downgrades haven't happened. And you've got a month for reporting season. And I don't see these things being uh, coming out with great outlook. So mm -hmm. no, no need to rush into retail uh, before the reporting season. Yep. Thank you. All right, let's get to Austal. It's on the list. This is from Richard. Richard, remember, this is not tailored advice for your own personal circumstances. Take it as information only. Austal for Richard wants to know, because he bought a small holding a couple of months back, 1.5% of its portfolio. He thinks that defense spending will likely increase, and he saw that Andrew Forrest bought a bit of Austal, so that was pretty encouraging too. I believe Austal has a WA history in it. Um, he says the nice contract uh, win of a couple weeks ago was good, so should he be increasing his exposure to Austal? Um, or just sit pat, be happy with any gains that he has achieved so far, and we'll go from there. Nathan, what do you think? This is a bit of a, a portfolio kind of question, knowing that he's already holding Austal. Yeah, look, uh, we, we were a fan of it um, because it came back and it was prized for not doing much. And you know that geopolitics was always going to come back. And this was in, in that. Um, but the, the problem with that is it runs a really high cost 
the input cost would be pretty high, labor cost would be high. This is the kind of business that actually burns a lot of cost while sitting around waiting for contracts. So when it works and there's a lot of contracts coming in, Austral just absolutely creams it. But when it's not, they're still burning a lot of money. So it's one of those businesses that you want to be there when the cycle turns and people are doing a lot of things. Uh, you don't want to be there when they're not doing so many things. Um, so and in the current stage, it is interesting. There is a lot of geopolitics, but it's not driving them that much more business. So I would say wait and see. Don't get too carried away. If you got in in, in the last year, you've had a pop for the right reason. I think you got in pretty cheap. Now I think you've got to wait and see if they continue to win contracts. If they win a few more contracts, then I would start to add more. Um, it's a momentum trade. So without winning more contracts, I think it still gets into trouble because they still burn a lot of money standing still. So in that context, wait and see how it plays out. Um, and it's it's a better risk management in the moment. I think there's a lot of budget pressure. So I don't see too many people doing too much unless geopolitics really picks up. So I would be waiting to see how the contracts play out. And if it does well, then keep buying more. No need to buy now. Do you agree, <clears throat> Adam? Yeah, I look at you look, looking at that chart there, it certainly looks like that. Um, it, 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 it's got more to go, but I think if you look at that sort of that chart that we the first chart that we saw, it's hitting that all time sort of high that 250, which is a clear signal that potentially this thing's going to have some resistance around that two dollars fifty and potentially come off. But I, I, I yeah, so that one there, look, so mm -hmm. in short term you could really say take some money off the table there because it could roll from there. But Nathan's absolutely correct. They've got a design or construction of a 11 offshore patrol cutters, which is the US Coast Guard boats, which could lead to further maintenance and more work going forward into that. But that initial contract is going to generate them 300 million over 10 years, which isn't a bad thing. But the problem is with this is, and you know, going forward is, is and this isn't my, uh, this is from JP Morgan, but JP Morgan says that the, the, the deal is, is very, very good. However, uh, Austel has limited experience in building steel hulled vessels. So um, of that size for the US Coast Guard. So they think there's a risk that they bid too competitively. So in mm -hmm. other words, they cut their prices to get the bid. And then they've got to work out some issues potentially. Correct, to win the contract to get it moving. So again, that's not my analysis, um, but I, I, you know, I don't, I mean, I know a lot about the company, but that, uh, you know, sort of lifting the little bit of a bit, that would be concerning for me. So I would potentially look to take some profits up here uh, as it goes, uh, and then wait to see if it does come back, then you can pick some more up. So I'd be cautious at these levels, and I think it'd be a trading sell for me. Got it, thank you. All right, guys, we're moving right along on this Friday. Woolworths is the next on the list. This is for Dean. Uh, Dean, I hope you're watching or listening. Thanks for writing in. This is a company that, of course, Adam, we often mm. talk about being resilient through any sort of an economic Bread, milk and downturn. Cheese. Yep. Uh, it's obviously a household name, mm -hmm. um, but pricing power in this environment. Mm. So we, we've, we've been negative on Woolworths, Coles, uh, not Met Cash, we like Met Cash, but we've been negative on the two biggest supermarkets over the last sort of four months, five months. One with oil prices going higher, mm -hmm. head of lettuce getting up to $10 and now coming back to $5, bananas getting over to $5 now back to sort of $3.50. I know, can you see my, my complexion has improved because I'm eating <laughs> lettuce and bananas again lately. That's right. Well, I had a salad the other day and the, the lettuce was the most expensive thing on the dish. So, um, uh, so yeah, so I like, um, that is now starting to abate or starting to come back as in oil prices now starting to come down, supply chain issues are starting to open up again. Um, and I think that the last six months of Woolworths Coles where we were sort of fairly negative, I think a lot of that stuff has now come through. So um, rising food prices is going to help uh, Woolworths as well as then um, basically getting some um, suppliers and indicating that food inflation is starting to come back a little bit and starting to fall, then I think this one, for me, it's still a hold. I think Met Cash is a better buy because it has 20% of its revenue coming from Mitre 10, so it's got some more diversification. But I still think that uh, we've come off our sort of sell stance and it's a hold from me. Got it, thank you. How about you, Nathan? Do you look for and seek shelter and defensiveness in the big grocers? Yeah, look, we've been a fan of the staples. Woolies is our preferred one, go for the big boy. Um, and actually, the one that's done better for us is the is Endeavour, which mm. split out of Woolworths. Mm. It's been the best performer. Um, you know, you always know the Aussies drink even more in a recession. So 
You can always back them to get drunk. Uh, so in that context, Endeavor is doing even better. Uh, but look, Woolies is a very good defensive play. They benefit from inflation. They just don't care. Whatever the price is, they put their margin on top. Um, and no matter where you are cutting back, you have no choice but to buy the staples. So in that context, uh, you know, your hoarding goes from panic buying, goes from toilet tissue to pasta to eggs recently. Um, lettuce had its run, now it's the eggs. Um, so there's always something. So in that context, I think they're quite defensive, good yield for this market. I think I'm happy to hold them, but look, it's it's bounced back. Um, so I don't think you're getting the cheap anymore. Uh, but it's, look, for this market, for the risk it's in the market, it's actually a pretty good long-term business model. Um, I don't think they're going to suddenly, you know, shoot the lights out, but I don't think they're going to struggle either. So if I'm going to haul someone through the reporting season, this is one of those stocks I'm happy to hold. It's a hold, uh, it's a solid hold, and, and I'm uh, more than happy to hold this through. Um, the outperformer has been Endeavor that split out of Woolies. So Nathan, with the uh, Endeavor, um, you just, you know, potentially that's defied gravity. Um, do you think that potentially this one could come back with the rest of the markets already come back sort of 10, 15 percent, but Endeavor's just defying that gravity. And obviously it's a fantastic business. I, lo- I-, I love Dan Murphy's, um, I lo- you know, I'm a-, a big fan of the business, but I've been taking a little bit of profit in Endeavor up here because I just think it, it has defied too much of the gravity and potentially could come back. What's your thoughts? Do you think it, it might come back in the next coming couple of weeks? Yeah, that's an interesting one. You you know, you have to look at what you have and then if you're going to change, you've got to look for something better than what you have mm. um, and the risk return on the option. Endeavor for me is someone that could be uh, the Bunnings of alcohol business. Um, it's got the upside of um, the hospital hospitalization, sorry, um, uh, the, the accommodation and all of that, you know, reopening yeah. cycle, holidays, coming into play and that'll help them even more. Um, their opening of, uh, I suppose, even in a lockdown type of um, environment, their online business is pretty solid. So it's a good diversified play. Um, it's a good defensive play in the Aussie culture. It actually holds up pretty well. Um, and everyone is now traveling. There's more tourism playing out. So that should play well for them um, in multiple parts of their business. So I'm actually happy to hold them. And I think that's why the market is paying up. Um, and they're, they're able to buy more and more locations because a lot of distressed sellers are out there. Yeah, there's consolidation. So that kind of thing plays well for them in this current cycle. And the fact that they were underneath bullies didn't give them management interest to do stuff. Now that they're split out, there's management concentrating on growing the business. So I think, look, I think it could be the Bunnings of alcohol business. So in that aspect, I'm willing to hold through it. There's not a lot of top 100 stocks that are doing as well as um, Endeavor. So in that context, this market, um, you don't want to sell a winner that's not on massive multiple. It's not a growth stock, it's a staple, and the market's willing to pay. So uh, I'm happy to hold them through the reporting season rather than many other stocks. Okay, good chat, guys. Thank you for that. Uh, Just uh, keeping an eye on our local market down by 1% at this stage. So 12.30, roundabout there here in Sydney on this Friday afternoon. Um, I'll just recap what we've learned so far. So Rio, Nathan reckons there's no need to buy now. This is the stock of the day because you will be able to get it cheaper. Adam says he'd be looking to add to positions at about $87 for Rio. So that's not a buy today. It's around 93, something like that. Uh, Paradigm bias, um, Biopharmaceuticals is high risk, high return, but Nathan is not touching it right now. The brokers are downgrading it. Why would you get in at this time? He never buys in a downgrade cycle. It's a sell for Adam. It's uh, too risky for him. He would prefer CSL, ResMed in the healthcare space. Neometals, it is a no for Nathan at this time. It's going to struggle, he says, in the short term. Uh, Look, it's a hold for Adam. He doesn't mind the story, but uh, it's just not his pick in the space. IGO, so independent, uh, the ex-independent, it's his pick in the space. Best and less, no love for it from either one of my guests. Not the right time in the cycle. Uh, Adam was generous. He would prefer West Farmers in that space. Nathan says, though, keep an eye on these retailers. They have been damaged. They're not quite cheap enough yet, but uh, he's going to be looking through uh, some of these results pretty closely, I would say, this coming reporting season. Austell, it's a wait and see. It's a wait for Nathan. You want to buy it on momentum when the share price is rising. He says, 
it's not financial advice, but Richard, it looks like you've got enough for now. It's actually a sell uh, to take some profits for Adam. And um, look, when we come to Woolworths, it's a hold for Mathan. You heard why it's preferred in this space. Adam says Metcash is a better buy right now, but he will hold it because he actually thinks the tide might be turning for some of these big grocers. And you heard their conversations. That's a bit of a bonus for you about Endeavor Group. I was interested myself. So we don't have two buys yet. So nothing's going to the investment committee. However, they will meet again and they will be mulling over the portfolio as it stands now. So last month we took out Tyro, Qantas, Frontier Digital Ventures, Tab Corp, Steadfast, added Babcor. Cash holding about 10%. So far, the fund is down, let's see, about 4.6% on a cumulative return basis since its inception on March 1st. Look, not bad Yeah. yeah in the grand, yeah. grand scheme of things. Okay, keep those requests coming in and we will keep you updated on the committee and what they'll be looking at next. Stay with us. is brought to you by Australian Vintage Wines. Invest in the home of Australia's premium wine brands. Welcome back, wonderful to be here with you on this Friday afternoon. Companies coming up, Yoji, Silver Mines, Tassel, Invocare, and Hearts and Minds Investments. Uh, let's begin with Yoji for Rafi. I'm gonna start with you, Nathan, on this one. He's just very interested to hear everybody's thoughts on this company what do you think Nathan yeah this is an interesting one it's uh, basically your logistics um, in um, Asia um, so it's your micro cap uh, play in transport logistics um, and I'm sure it'll get a bit of interest because Ystec just had a, a, a guidance upgrade yep. and that'll get uh, all the logistics company being this is, at. Sorry to interrupt, but this is software. Yeah. This is software as a service in the logistics space. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, and so in that context, I think it's an interesting one. It's a small one. Look, it's it's tough. Um, they're in multiple countries. They've gone through a growth phase. The question now is everyone was wondering, is that going to be taken over? Um, and then the sentiment turned on all the techs and it's come off as well. Um, again, it's early stage. Um, and in that context, it struggles and there's probably uh, the market will worry about cap raising coming and that's normal with small techs um, and that's going to play out. There was uh, rumors that potentially Ystec would take them out and again that's another uh, potential that's playing out. So um, where do you go from here? It's, it's, it's tough to see how this plays out. It probably, look, it is a potential takeover target. It's in an interesting sector, emerging markets but you know how the economies are in emerging market at the moment, they're all struggling, consumers are struggling. So things might slow down, things might get harder to do in the shorter term, so it'll probably struggle. Um, again, I like a lot of stocks that have emerging market exposure, but you have to understand that there's gonna be a high risk into the uh, economies, um, especially with political and social unrest in a number of countries. So I'd be a bit careful right now. I wouldn't be jumping in right now, but I am keeping a list of a lot of uh, companies that predominantly work in emerging markets because at some point the economies will set to st stabilize and then the recovery cycle will start and that's the time to jump into these. Right now is probably not the best time. You've got emerging market worries, you've got tech worries, um, and then you've got market multiple worries. So all of these things will be against them. So it is one on my shopping list. It is a high risk play but it's one for to keep on your shopping list, not to jump in right now. Agree with okay. everything uh, Nathan just said. I, I, you know, only thing I can add is, in, and more on the sort of uh, the trading side, is there's, there's a lot of paper on this one, 1.1 billion shares on issue. So it really does need to get through a lot of paper to make the share price move higher. So just be really careful about that. They've got a bit of cash on their, on their balance sheet, so things look okay there. But yeah, it, it's, 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 it's a no from me. You just look at that chart that we just saw, um, that should tell you a thousand words that this thing is, is continuing just to be sold down. 
and especially with the tech side mm -hmm. uh, getting hit, I think it's yeah, there's, there's uh, it's, it's a no. It's an avoid. It's, it's an, an no. avoid. Okay, yeah. let's get to number seven on the list, and this is about silver mines, and it is for Rupam. Thanks for writing in. He's looking for a bit of a view on SVL. Um, look, it's fallen a lot in line with silver spot prices. He says, like to know about the fundamentals. He's sitting on a loss. He wants to know if he should book his losses. We're not giving financial advice, but you know, wanting to get a view on the company and the silver price outlook in general, uh, because Adam, you know, silver follows gold. Yeah, and uh, not been doing much. Well, gold hasn't been doing much either. No. Let's be honest. We really got to get to see that gold price starting to move because it's just. It's been really tough for the gold space and obviously the gold stocks as well as these silver stocks uh, have been hit with higher costs, labor costs, COVID, you know, the list goes on of those kinds of things. But I did a little bit of work on this one just to sort of have a look because when you're looking at a mining company, there's a couple of things that I look at. One is that how much does it cost? So all in sustaining costs, how much does it cost them to get it out of the ground? Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, looking at their strip ratio. So in other words, how much dirt do they need to move to get an ounce or a, a, an ounce of silver, or an ounce of gold? And then from there, um, really sort of how is the overall um, uh, exploration versus production going forward? So there's a long list there and I'll be very, very quick, but we'll go starting at the top. Production is looking okay. So they're doing, uh, they're doing okay on their production side of things. So they will do that. There is talk about them using, uh, their, um, at the moment they're in an open cut mine. Uh, they might have, because they can't go too far down with an open cut mine, they're gonna have to go underground, which is gonna raise their costs. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of care for that, but production and ore mined is being good. The strip ratio is at 1.6%, so that's actually not too bad. Usually you can get up to four. So in other words, you've got to move four units of dirt to get one unit of, of uh, gold, silver out of the ground. So at 1.6, that's actually not too bad. So the strip ratio is not too bad. And then they're all in sustaining costs is around, uh, Aussie dollars is around $17.53 at the moment. Now spot silver is sitting around about $26. Um, so they are making some profit on that as well. So that's that's a key for me. But in saying all of that, I think I'd be really cautious about silver going forward. I'd be really cautious because that chart really should tell you that there's some there's uh, some further downside to go in silver mines. Again, the commodity hasn't been moving so well. So I'd be steering clear of this one. Would I'd you be, sell it if you held it? Yeah, I would. Um, because I just, yeah, if you got to look at what the commodity is doing. The commodity isn't doing much and there's probably better places to put your money. One, because I think that, um, you know, it's going to be tough and we'll see all of these miners really like Rio did today. We're going to see these, these, these costs rising and that's going to be a real issue for a lot of them. So, yeah, it would be a no from me. Nathan, do you see it any differently when it comes to silver mine? Yeah, no, unfortunately, um, it's it's a tough play, as with all miners at the moment. Um, interestingly, the ones that have been hit for everything is the gold miners, even for the high high cost of uh, mining, uh, where the other miners haven't actually faced it. So the risk going into reporting season is that every other miner starts to uh, come in and say that we got higher cost and get hit for it. I mean, we've seen that with the iron ore um, Rio today. Um, the other thing to remember is it's actually an interesting the correlation of silver versus gold uh, to the US market. So when you've got a recession worry and the US market is underperforming, generally silver will underperform gold. So in that context, gold is not doing a lot um, despite high inflation, which I think uh, at some point it will, but silver will continue to underperform gold in, in a recession worry market pullback cycle. So in the short term, silver is going to struggle unless we get some kind of uh, stimulus kick to recover, which I can't see with the inflation where it is. I think silver in the short term will be under pressure. Um, and so that's what worries me. I think the risk return for me still um, sticks with gold. Uh, the valuations are better in gold uh, and the downgrades have already been priced in for the higher cost. So for me, it just doesn't work. So I would be a bit careful here. Um, I, I think it's tough play, to, especially going into a reporting season. The quarterly is coming out of mining stocks. Um, I'd be taking my money off and seeing how it plays out over the next month. Two um, it's a tough play to be in miners. Yeah. yeah, okay, so there you go. Uh, Rupam, I'm not sure if that's what you wanted to hear, but that's what you get. Okay, let's get to the next company on the list. Tassel, TGR is the ticker code for Matt. I had a conversation with a, um, an investor, a small cap investor earlier this week who's pretty positive on Tassel. Nathan, we've got uh, demand for healthy seafood rising. We've got 
uh, inflationary pressures, of course, you know, the cost of all this is going up, input, but also prices that can be charged. So is this one of those food thematics that is worth your time? Yeah, look, I'll, we've been a big fan, massive fan. And uh, unfortunately, so has uh, everyone else. So it is uh, M&A talk and it's popped. Uh, so your discount is gone. Um, we were following, I mean, you can follow the global salmon prices um, and in uh, Norway, and if you convert it to Aussie dollar, it was pretty high. So we're talking uh, multi-year high. So they're, they're doing quite well. Um, I buy salmon all the time at Woolies to keep a track of the pricing that uh, Tassel sells at. Uh, and my kids love it too. Um, well, they have no choice. Um, so in reality, um, you just don't get the sale price. It's, it holds up even through the lockdowns, it held up. Uh, the prices never came down. So Tassel is a vertically integrated business. They got the retail to the production um, and it's done well. Now they're also doing outside uh, salmon, they're doing more prawns. And so there's a fair amount of capex that has gone through. Why did the uh, M&A uh, play come in now? Is because a lot of that capex is done, so they're coming in before the pro performance kicks in. Uh, it's interesting. Look, you know, smart people want to buy cheap. Um, so the, it was cheap. It's not cheap anymore. Um, there's always risk in any kind of, um, you know, whether it's agriculture or aquaculture. There's always risk. So you want to get the discount for the move, and once the discount is gone, it's just a bit of a tough play. Would I be buying Tassel here? I think it's hard um, because you, you know, the real discount is gone. Uh, but look, it's a good business. The food thematic plays really well for them. Yeah, I'm just a bit annoyed that it happened too quickly. Yeah, well, so would you sell and take profits then, Nathan? Yes, yeah. this, this is the type of market where you just got to trade. When, you, when the discount is not there, there's always risk in a cycle. You take the money and go somewhere else. And I think you've done well, um, take your money and go somewhere else. Adam? Uh, I'm going to go to the other side to Nathan on this one. I don't uh, touch any kind of, uh, ag well, not agricultural stocks, but certainly fish uh, uh, products because we had Huon, which was uh, taken out in 2021. And in fact, Cook Incorporated uh, actually put a bid in for Huon, who is the, the ones that are now trying to uh, go for Tassel. So they've been trawling for oh, uh, acquisitions in the market. <laughs> I've got one for IVC in a sec. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> Ratings uh, just went. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so they have been looking around and obviously they tried for Huon. They didn't get it. Yeah. Um, a Brazilian meat packaging company got Huon back in 2021. They've come to now to get to Tassel. They've put three bids in, at, uh, top one now at $4.85. Tassel's not entering into any agreement and basically said to shareholders, wait and see um, how that's going. But I'm not really a fan of these things because there's so much that can go wrong with production, especially when you're talking about live animals. There's diseases, the water temperature is too warm. There's so many things that can happen with this one. So I think if you've got stock in this one, I would take your money and run. So I agree with Nathan on this one. Um, I don't know if uh, Cook Incorporated is going to raise their bid. I think they're going to be pretty there, but but they have been hunting in, uh, in, in Australia for these kinds of things. So I think they will try and get this one. But for me, take your money. I don't think you need to be there. Thank you. Adam, now I've got to start with you with InvoCare yeah. for Jeremy. <laughs> So what is it? That's well, they're all dying to get in, aren't oh, they? Huh? Huh? There we go. All right. No more jokes, everybody. That's it. I'm done. Is that a joke? <laughs> well, okay. That Anyways. was a dad joke anyway, <laughs> at least. Um, so, yeah, Invocare. Should I start? Let's yeah. go. What do you hey. think? Buy um, uh, I think it's a hold. Uh, overall, it's, 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 it's all about mortality rates. Basically, mortality rates have been fairly decent uh, here in Australia and New Zealand. But you've got to be uh, a little bit careful. Obviously, COVID, you know, sort of, and flu season and all those kinds of things. But people are living longer. So it is sort of uh, a bit of a tough one. They made some acquisitions in the uh, UK. They've got New Zealand. Um, you know, their case is, is that they, they get less death rates, which means the price comes back. But the bullish bear case is that long-term death rates are starting to increase around about 1.7% per annum. So I think it's, 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 it's a good business. It's quite defensive. Yeah, um, going forward. So for me, it would be a hold. Um, I'd like to see the price get back sort of sub $10 before you pick it up as a buy. But at the moment around this sort of, uh, I think it's around about 11 bucks or something, something like that. Oh, and a 10 67. So yeah, you'd see that little dip back there, mm -hmm. that 10, yeah, that, that'd be where you'd be picking up. So I'd be sort of putting prices in a little bit lower. But look, it's a, it's a good business, quite defensive. 
but uh, it would be a hole for me at the moment. Nathan, what about Invocare? Oh, there's so many puns. Where do I start? <laughs> um, you know, uh, I mean, I, I live near a drive past a cemetery and I always tell my daughter, people are dying to get in there. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm no, definitely the next one dying. you say when you drive by a cer- uh, cemetery, you say to your kids, how many people you think are dead in there? Oh. <laughs> Gets them every time. Gets them every time. <laughs> That's a mum. But we shouldn't be joking about this. Yeah. Uh, Invocare. Yeah. Uh, look, it's it's the thing about this one is the model is it, it was an interesting model. Like it's a growth model by acquisition, right? Mm. Originally, and then what went wrong was what happened in UK. Uh, in UK, in the uh, funeral business, they started to sell prepaid funerals. Mm-hmm. That killed the business model because when you're having a funeral, it's an emotional purchase, so people overpay for services. Uh, you know, it's a bit like going into JB Hi-Fi and buying stuff you don't need. Um, and they do that. But when you prepay something, it's not an emotional decision process. You will make a logical uh, and generally a cheaper option. So the margins got squeezed at the end of that. That was a lesson we learned out of UK. And that got translated into Australia. So a lot of that uh, big margin plays actually got reduced. So the business model came back. So pre-pandemic, that came back. and. And with the pandemic, everyone's you know staying home, taking more uh, vaccines, so you have less death, um, and that's going to curb them. But look, it's a bit like bankruptcy. Eventually, everything goes back to the mean, and as death rates revert to the mean, uh, you should get a pickup there. But it's not a high growth play. It's not a you know, I hate to use the word. It's not a sexy business model. Um, you you want to you, you've got to look at the risk return that you're getting at. And I don't think this is going to do a lot. I don't think it's a bad business. I just don't think you're going to get a massive growth outlook out of it. And you're going into a low growth environment. So you, what you're looking for is cyclical growth stocks that are being underpriced. So when the cycle turns, you get the upside. Uh, and this is not one of them. Um, I don't think you're going to get that recovery in, the, in this kind of business model. It's a stable model. Everyone knows it and it's not going to do a lot. It'll do a bit, but it's not going to do a lot. So. For me, I just don't see why you would want to take, because any risk investment has a risk. It's got a market risk. If market falls, everything falls. So in that context, you're taking a risk. So you want the return for that risk, mm-hmm. and InvoCare just doesn't do it for me at the moment. Okay, so you would not be buying. If you had it, would you sell it? Well, if you have it, you bought it for a particular reason that a defensive yield play as part of a portfolio, then you know if that is the case, then that's fine. You can yeah. hold it. Yeah. Uh, but as an individual case, as an investment uh, case, I struggled to find it. Got it. Thank you. All right. Last on the list, Hearts and Minds Investments, HM1 <coughs> is the ticker code. Looking for a view for DES, taking a small position, actually. Uh, we sort of know what it does, but uh, the share price has really been suffering. But wondering if there's a bottom forming or, you know, if this was an, a buying opportunity. What do you think, Adam, Hearts and Minds? Yeah, as all fund managers have mm-hmm. really struggled and these guys aren't any what immune to what's going on with obviously our market falling by sort of, you know, the US market, S&P 500 down sort of 20%, NASDAQ down 30%, our market down sort of 15%. But the problem is with these guys is that their portfolio over the last six months has fallen by 31%. So it's more than the S&P 500 and in fact close to more than NASDAQ. So that means that they did have a lot of technology businesses inside of that fund. So that has been a real sort of red flag for me uh, on this business. But it's a great idea, the business, yeah? yeah? So, uh, you know... It's very easy to, to buy into a, the sentiment. Well, it's it. a great sell for clients as well. Like, I can just talk to them and say, well, we're doing something good. So it's got the uh, ESG, it's got the S, you mm-hmm. know, in that ESG side of things. It's got that social, you know, side of things. So I think it's okay, um, I, I, you know... You, so in other words, it's a hold from me. I think GQG is, is a better buy. It's another fund manager that's done quite well. It's a new, newly listed one. So that would be something that I would look at. I think their NTA uh, for Hearts and Minds has is, is obviously come back and the stock has certainly come back with the rest of it. But for me, um, yeah, I'd be cautious down here on it. Um, 
Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, do you want a Magellan? Probably not. You know, there's there's a lot of other fund managers on the on the market, but I do like it because it does have that uh, social side of things to it. Yeah, I suppose we don't know when Des bought this small position because if you're buying now, well, then yeah. you know you could potentially see a rebound coming through once we see the cycle change. But if you bought back in 2021, you're you're suffering. Definitely suffering. So yeah, I. I yeah, well, we don't know the position. So yeah. um, overall, it's been it's it's gone lower than the rest of the index, which is a negative. That means and underperformance. Mm-hmm. Obviously, your fees are going to um, going to charities, but their top ten holdings: Alphabet, CSL. Um, there's IDP Education, like the the they're, they're, they're good quality businesses. But I just think that underperformance is going to hurt them and will take time for that to wash through. So it would be a no from me. Okay, so don't buy it, but if you're holding it, hold it. Yeah, I'm happy to hold it. I mean, it's Nathan, got, it's what do you think about HM1, Hurts and Minds? Yeah, look, it's, um, you're, you're here to make money. Um, it's an investment strategy. Um, you, you know, um, it's as simple as that. For me, fund managers run. Uh, stay away from fund managers because market underperforms. A lot of people talk a lot of risk management uh, and then you see what the actual portfolio has done, and that shows you whether that risk management actually worked or not. Because we are having a real life test in a bear market. Mm. And so that tells you where they are. The problem with fund manager model is you're going to get the underperformance. And reality is they make most of their money on our performance fees. So most fund managers will not be taking their uh, put off the, I suppose, the high beta plays because that's the way to recover. Uh, so in that context, if the market goes lower, they'll keep going lower. Now, the problem with that is the, the problem is you're buying a business model that's probably going to see more outflows because of the underperformance. So you don't know how that's going to play out till the outflows stop. So the outflows won't happen now. It'll happen later. So the market will sell them for the underperformance and then they'll sell them again for the outflows. So you've got to wait and see how that plays out. So fund managers usually take a lot longer than other stocks on the recovery cycle. So it's a second derivative for me. So that's not in the top of the list for the recovery cycle. So I'm not actually picking any fund managers. Um, I'm staying out of them and let the cycle play out. When you start to see inflows into some of these fund managers, that's when you buy them because then all the bad news is out. Right now, you're probably going to go through the underperformance and then you're going to see outflows. So now is not the time to pick fund managers. June Bay from Tribeca always says, yes. follow the fund flows. That's right. Hey, all right, name dropping here on this Friday. <laughs> um, guys, I let it go long because it was such a good episode. Um, always so good to have you joining us. Uh, let me just run through what we've learned from our guests so far. Yoji, it is a not now, no rush from both of my guests. Silver Mines, a sell from both. Tough business, particularly now. Tassel, bit of disagreement here. Uh, not a fan, Adam. Yep. Massive fan, Nathan, <laughs> but both would not be buying it right now. In fact, Adam would sell it if you have it. Um, look, I think that Nathan would sell to crystallize some profits as well. Invocare, it is a yield play. If you've got it, you can continue to hold it, but Nathan just doesn't think you're going to grow your pie much by holding that one. It's defensive in Adam's view as well, but just a hold. Maybe below $10 you could look to buy it. And you just heard what they said about hearts and minds investments. Nathan Somasandram, nice to see you. Thank you so much for joining us from Deep Data Analytics. And Adam Jaws, Sean Partners, so we're seeing you for a drink. Absolutely. 345, last call. I'll be here. I'll pour you a drink. Thank you. All right. So thank you for watching. Thanks for sending in your questions. The call at osbiz.com.au. Stay with us. The Small Caps is next. The Call is brought to you by CMC Markets, a world-leading online trading platform for CFDs and shares around the globe.
the opportunity for Australian organisations is really to explore those opportunities and start experimenting. Trust is really the new currency in this economy, in the world of AI. Join me each Friday at 2pm, where we'll ask the big questions to the country's top cyber experts. Stream on osbiz.com.au or on demand. Managing your own super used to be complicated. Not anymore. With Stake Super, signing up for your SMSF takes three minutes and not a single piece of paper. Once you're set, you can invest your super on the ASX and Wall Street, right on the Stake platform. But leave all the admin and accounting to us. That's included in the annual fee of just $990. Take control of your super with Stake Super, Australia's most hassle-free SMSF. The Pulse is brought to you by Zerilio, cybersecurity experts protecting Australian businesses and organisations so we can all be safer together. The Small Caps is partnered with the Australian Stock Report. Looking to make better investment decisions? Visit australianstockreport.com.au. Welcome to the program. This is Small Caps on this Friday afternoon. I'm Nadine Blaney. Well, today I'll be speaking with David Burton. He is the CompuMedic CEO after the company released an update yesterday. First, though, let's check in on the market. That's what I was just looking at because it's interesting to see that the, the Chi X200, the SIBO Australia Index, and the SP ASX200 have actually gained ground in the wake of that real stinker of a quarterly GDP read coming from China counterintuitively perhaps, but what it also may mean is that we'll see more stimulus coming through in China as it looks to achieve its economic goals. Still though in the doldrums when it comes to particularly the small indices and that's being reflected in some of these ETFs that track the smaller end of the market. Uh, Prescient is doing well, it's up by 12%. Austin Engineering came out with a guidance upgrade coming in up 8%. Flipping the page, and as we look to see what's weighing on this market, you can see their blue bet holdings is off by about 11%. Now let's get to a bit of a wrap of today's small cap news, and Rex shares are 